what is killing Africans right now are the endemic infectious diseases, HIV, TB, malaria, and even some of the neglected ones like hepatitis. More than one million Africans die annually from HIV AIDS. Malaria kills another 500,000 annually. Viral hepatitis kills 200,000. Ebola in West Africa in the outbreak killed 12,000. And COVID-19 has killed 260,000. Therefore, you can see that we need to, to continue to focus also not just on the emerging threats, but on the, these major infectious diseases that are responsible for the deaths, majority of the deaths on the African continent. In 2013, when our head of states met in Abuja, they were very concerned about the fact that most Africans die from HIV, TB, malaria. And they decided that was the first time they muted an idea of setting up a public health, a continental public health institution. However, in 2014, the outbreak in West Africa shifted that attention of Africa CDC to emerging and re-emerging infectious diseases like Ebola that have the ability to cause both economic and health uh, uh, complications. Therefore, when Africa CDC was set up in 2016 and launched in 2017, the focus was on the getting a continental public health institution that can be able to respond to emerging and re-emerging infectious diseases. But even at that time, it was recognized that we do need to tackle these endemic diseases that are with us and causing most of the, uh, uh, the mortality and morbidity on the continent. And I'm very grateful to the uh, moderator for also mentioning non-communicable diseases, injuries, and mental health. We should not forget that Africa is already in a triple uh, burden uh, 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 epidemiologically. Now, right in the middle of the pandemic, it became apparent that we need basic health system to be able to respond to outbreaks and even the pandemic. Africa CDC then took upon itself to operationalize the Division of Disease Control and Prevention that is responsible for working with the uh, Greater African Union Commission in the prevention and control of HIV, TB, malaria, other uh, uh, endemic diseases and neglected tropical diseases and non-communicable diseases, injuries, and mental health. In this regard, the good work that's already been done by the Health and Humanitarian um, uh, Services de uh, Department of the Commission, where we already have the Africa Health Strategy 2015 to 2030, the catalytic framework for HIV, TB, and malaria control, the framework and common African position on NTDs, and the Cairo Declaration on Hepatitis, Working very closely with them, Africa CDC intend to begin to support member states in the implementation of the, uh, what they are already doing, working with other partners to ensure that these uh, declarations, frameworks, and other documents produced by a head of state, we are able to work very closely with other partners to deliver on this. Uh, on this. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, let me, uh, with this sh short uh, introduction and welcome to all of you, hand over back to the moderator so that we can have a very interesting session ahead. Thank you. A big hand. Thank you very much, Prof, for that opening remarks and really encompasses all that we're going to be discussing here. So now we'll move on with our discussions and we'll start with Prof Agnes Binaguayo, 
who is the co-chair for the CPHIA 2022. And Prof. Agnes, we just want to say thank you. I think we need a chair from the audience to say thank you for organizing this conference that we are all having such a time for. So you have the floor now. Thank you. Thanks. It is a success thanks to all of you. So thank you very much. I had some slides. I don't know if uh, they will pass them. Yes. Now. So good evening to everybody. It's good to be here, but I need to feel the energy of Africa. Good evening to everybody. Good. Better. So um, I'm going to discuss the state of uh, HIV in Africa um, because if you remember 20 years ago it was our big nightmare remember we were supposed to be the continent was supposed to be totally destroyed economically and in all uh, uh, domain due to this disease so where do we stand now? Then we have other epidemic, other pandemic, and also uh, that we start to take care about the non-communicable disease that are killing so many of our people. Next slide. Oh, it's me. Forgot, sorry. So this is where the people living with HIV belong to. And you can see that the majority of them are in the global south. In Africa, in Asia, in America, it is in the south. You can see also that new infections or death related due to HIV are in East and Southern Africa in for the majority of them. And the rest, Middle East, Asia, Europe, they have very few. We have the majority of new infections, the majority of uh, death in our continent. Even though it is decreasing, it's still very significant. For a disease that we know how to prevent, we miss the point here. It, the trend of new infection and death are going down, but not as we should, because it's totally preventable. Except the little percentage transmitted through parental transmission. I say parental because mother to child transmission put the stigma on the mother. Parental transmission. So you can see here that uh, we have done uh, some progress. Is there a mic so I can follow? Do we have a mobile mic? Uh, you, you can see here that progress to n the 1990 target that has been signed off by countries has been successfully reached only in a few countries. Botswana, Uganda, Rwanda, Thank you very much. Uh, Malawi, so Botswana, uh, Malawi, Rwanda, Uganda, and uh, <clears throat> you can see that we are far to reach the target we have agreed on a couple of years ago. And the good health and the quality of life of the people living with HIV need to take in account the comorbidity, you know that people living with HIV have more cancer and more comorbidity, 
And this is still, um, there is still a lot to do to address that. Next, this is me again. You can see also that the cascade of uh, diagnostic, starting treatment, and survival didn't reach the target we have given ourselves, 95, 95, 95. We are almost there, but not. We can do better together. And you see that it's in Africa that we have the majority of the case, and the rest of the world uh, didn't change. This is not new. There is no new information if we look five years ago. So in our continent, we need to make more efforts. The infection and death, you can see that there is an increase of, sorry, that's not, uh, I tried to point, no. I will not succeed with the technology. You can see that <clears throat> there is an increase in new infection and in death at a certain point in the middle uh, uh, due to refugees and movement of population. When people have go, live in a hurry their countries, they left the treatment behind. In refugee camp to organize the delivery of treatment, it takes time and it takes countries' agreement with the UN um, this is me, normally nobody called me all the day, they just, <laughs> <laughs> sorry for that. So when people are rushing in refugee camp and they are on treatment, it's complicated to do a procurement process and to trade them. So that's where you can see that in Eastern Europe and Central Asia, at a certain point, there was a peak. So COVID-19 has also disturbed through the lockdowns. People were not able to go and do their follow-up, the, bi the biochemistry exam, et cetera. And some of them had also problem to go and pick the, 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 the medicine. Uh, there was also a focus in some place uh, with the money dedicated to HIV going to respond to this new pandemic. And there was financial difficulties of some of the people uh, that are suffering from the disease. There were canceling of some services. There were some health workforce take from the infectious disease department that were caring for HIV that were dedicated to COVID-19 because there is a new disease but not new health workforces. And there were supply chain difficulties during the lockdown, remember, Plane were shut down, factories were shut down, and medicine were not uh, reaching uh, the patient. So there were many ways to respond to the strategies. First, um, giving more medicine to the people. In some countries, they, were, they had to come every three weeks. They passed to every three months so that they don't have to uh, come to the health facilities on a regular basis. There were use of telemedicine. There was also, uh, I put there, addressing misinformation because the level of misinformation during COVID was so high that it was part of any type of response to put information right for the population and also provide financial support to the people to go to the health facilities to, f to do their follow-up and to get the medicine. So to, for this to be a success, you need to create a resilient health system, but you don't create a resilient health system in the middle of a crisis. It's in between crises that you create such a system. A system that really is adaptive, when we talk about resilient system, you need to have those five um, qualities. It has to be adaptive, 
the health system has the people who are managing has to know what they can do, what they are the limitation, and in these circumstances, what to support more because of new situation. The system has also to be self-regulated and, and serve the people in an integrated manner. So those are the qualities needed for a health system to be resilient. And a health system that is not resilient, cannot face new threats. And the people are suffering. We need also a health system that approach and provide service in an integrated manner. Because you may have, for example, a woman with HIV suffering from malaria and tuberculosis. So if you don't integrate, you are going to miss one or two of the disease that the woman is suffering. So make the most effort to have one point of care where the people suffering can have all the care that they may need for malaria, HIV, for antenatal clinic and delivery, for tuberculosis, but also for the non-communicable diseases. <clears throat> we need also to build a health system that are based on equity. If not, the people that are well off like you and us here will always be served. But the people the most in need who are the vulnerable will be always left out. So when you create a health system, create it in a way, or when you are repairing it, or when you are uh, improving it, do so that the most vulnerable are the one you have in mind for them to get the services. And those are, in the case of HIV, all the people that are uh, at risk, key population, sex workers, and, and others. The, the people that are vulnerable doesn't change. What has to change is the way we serve them. We need also to create trust. Trust for people to come. You remember those countries who refuse COVID-19 vaccine just because they distrust. And there is good studies done by Wellcome Trust and Gallup Institute that I advise you to read because they rank 140 countries and say why there is no trust. We need trust in the government. We need trust in the policymakers, but also in the executive sector and the judicial system. And probably because behind our head we say, if the health sector mistreats me, where can I complain? Who will take my, my, my complaint? And who will give me justice? So you need trust, but not only in the health sector. You need trust in the government, in the judiciary system, and in the executive system. We need also to apply implementation science. We have all those tools that are invented by what we call hard science, the medicine, the drug. But this is not health. It became health when people swallow the drugs, when they have the drugs at disposal and take it. So all along the way, if there is a barrier, we are missing the point. So we need to have an implementation science approach to health service delivery, from creating the tools to delivering the tools up to those who need it. Thank you. Thank you very much, Prof. Agnes. That's the state of HIV in Africa. We'll just move directly to Dr. Thomas Nyerenda, EDCTP, who will be talking to us about the state of TB in Africa.
Thank you very much uh, for that introduction, um, Rose. So uh, I will start with um, just a few facts that we know already and end my talk, which is going to be very short, uh, with two appeals or call for action. So TB has been around for many centuries, as you can see from that slide, and attacking very senior people in terms of society, hierarchy, all around the world for many, many years. These uh, the names of uh, the kings there, philosophers, poets, and politicians. And that has continued to the current day. As you see, those senior African citizens, they had confessed that they had TB at one point. So nobody is really spared. Tuberculosis is a global and African problem. This map is from the WHO, and the darker the area, the more the, the reported TB cases uh, annually. And to put it into perspective, if you can see the countries that contribute at least 100,000 cases per annum, Africa is also featuring highly there. You have countries like Nigeria, Mozambique, Tanzania, Uganda, that are already in the high burden uh, countries. But that's not only that. Uh, as Prof. Agnes has alluded to, HIV has been a major driving force of the epidemic. Although, as you can see from the slide now, there is, uh, there is, sorry, this is jumping like someone is now controlling me. <laughs> yeah, so th this slide shows that we have been making indeed significant progress. As you can see in green, the incident TB cases have been dropping over time since the year 2000 to going towards um, uh, 2020. And also HIV-related TB cases have been going down. The same with uh, TB deaths. And this is attributed to the successes of the programs that we have had, and one of which is the substantial expansion of the ART programs uh, in our countries. But there is always a complication. With all that kind of progress, MDRTB is another menace and is a big problem. As you can see from that map, um, Africa is not spared. And quite a number of countries are contributing significantly to the global MDR, XDR, TB, requiring new drug regimens and also more and more research into uh, the area. We know that more men suffer from TB than women but that again raises the question of whether this data is really reflecting what is on the ground. And I think those of you who are familiar with the Glo Stop TB Global uh, work, force, uh, work Task Force on Gender and TB, there's a lot of reports produced that there's a lot of work that needs to be done in this area to answer the question why women uh, are appearing in, in, in less numbers in terms of uh, case notification. 
the conclusion is probably that gender mainstreaming in TB is still an issue and a lot of bias and stigma against women that they don't come up to care and contributing to a lot of what we call missing cases and still transmitting tuberculosis in the communities. With all this, the good news is that we know what, it, what works. And this is what the TB world has called for many years the DOTS strategy. And it has five components. Political commitment and sustained funding being one, and case detection through quality assured methodologies, the second one, and availability of standard treatment with supervision, effective drug supply, and a monitoring and evaluation system in place. And many of these have been fulfilled at different levels and different um, uh, complexities depending on the country you're in. And more good news is that we have scientific advances that have made this application of DOTS to be more effective. Some of which are the discoveries of point of care diagnostics, although they're still a problem, but we know Gene Expert works quite well and has reduced the duration in which TB diagnosis is made. TB treatment arrangements are being studied and simplified. TB vaccine trials are ongoing and hopefully soon we can have a good, simplified, effective TB vaccine better than BCG. MDR-TB has now all arrangements. As you remember, in the recent past, we had injectables that are very toxic and contributed immensely to the, to the mortality rates of uh, patients with uh, resistant uh, tuberculosis. And more and more, the national TB pro programs are getting advances here and there and doing quite a very good jobs, which I think is something that is really commendable under the circumstances. Now came COVID, we've seen a lot of gains being reversed, as Professor Lakey said earlier, and mainly in three areas that I want to touch on. First is the increased TB incidence rates. In 2020, globally, there was 9.9 million, 9 .9 million cases of TB, and that rose to 2021 to 10.6 million. There have been reported increased deaths, and remember that 25% of TB deaths come from Sub-Saharan Africa, although we contribute a small proportion to the global figure. So we lose a lot of our TB patients, more than any other part of the world. And there has been decline in TB global spending during the COVID period. And the reports show that in 2019, TB absorbed 6 billion in terms of external funding, but it dropped to 5.4 million in 2021. This is a substantial drop. And we are looking forward to 2022 report and see what has been the impact of this global downturn, including the war in Ukraine, for example. So he, here comes uh, my uh, first call for uh, what we should do to correct this. First, I think we should be guided by the first NTB strategy milestones that we all agreed to for reduction of TB. The first is we agreed to reduce TB incidence by 20% from 2015 to 2020. 
The second was the reduction of 35% in mortality, again from 2015 to 2020. All is not lost. Some countries have made this a reality, and I've mentioned three countries there, Kenya, Tanzania, and Zambia, and data from Ethiopia shows that this is close to be a reality as well. So even in the hardest times, it, it has been possible for some countries to strive and work through the difficulties. The second call for me is for us to reconsider reprioritizing the priorities. And with this, I have a long list of things that I, I would like to mention very briefly in a short time. And the first is the increasing of the budget and human resources for existing TB and TBHIV services around the world. The second is the engagement of communities who are quite often sidelined when we are doing our work so that they can help us find the cases that we want to treat. The third is to strengthen active case finding with renewed technologies, especially new diagnostics, which some of which are still need to be improved or, um, or, or, or developed. The fourth is to reduce stigma at all levels. Sometimes I think we health workers are at the forefront of increasing stigma, just like we saw around COVID. When I was a medical officer in Malawi at, and working for the TB program, when I'm doing supervision, I always say to the head of the hospitals, why is the TB ward always at the back of the hospital between the mortuary and the maize field? And they didn't have an answer. But it's simple actions like this that contribute to this kind of stigma that we should, we should refrain from. Fifthly, I think we should integrate tuberculosis, HIV, and COVID services. These are, these are all respiratory diseases. And in the morning, I had a presentation and a call, someone saying, what about fungal diseases? Most of the patients that we exclude as TB negative, they end up dying of a fungal infection. So all these need to be considered as one package, one patient. Sixthly, I think we need to develop new strategies for surveillance, um, especially using digital platforms to follow up patients because we don't want to lose any. We need to treat all of them. Seventh, increase screening for both COVID and TB in high-risk groups. And uh, eighth, expand chest radiography. Tenth, strengthen community-based tuberculosis treatment services. And eleventh, scale up the virtual care for community monitoring solutions such as SMS and communications, which some of which have been presented in this conference at length. And lastly, we should ensure regular drug regular uh, supply of diagnostics and consider local drug manufacturing. And I think this is also something that has been mentioned in relation to COVID as well. So I will stop there. Thanks very much for your attention and I'd like to thank you all for your persistence and resilience to keep the TB programs alive in these difficult times. Thank you. Thank you very, very much, Tom. Thank you for that. Uh the good news we have on TB and the reminder of the NTB strategy milestone and of course the long list you have. We're going to move on now to malaria. Wow, malaria. The state of malaria in Africa. And I hope we have Professor Marielle Bouyou of the Université des Sciences de la Santé in Gabon who's supposed to be online, but if she's not right away, we're just going to move on. Is she online? Can someone confirm within the next five seconds? <laughs> no. She is online. We're just waiting for her to she turn. She is online. online. We're just... Professor.
Professor Mariel Boyo, you have 10 minutes. You have the floor. Thank you. I cannot share my screen. We do have her slides. Okay, so shall I begin? I don't see my slide. I don't see. Okay. Well, we're going to, uh, here it is. It's here. Okay. Okay, thank you. I would like to thank the organizer to give me the opportunity to present the current epidemiology of malaria in Africa and a quick overview of the impact of SARS-CoV-2 infection. Next slide. Okay, the recent uh, W report uh, highlight that in 2021, there were 247 million cases. Among the 600,000 deaths, uh, children, uh, African children uh, below five years represent almost 80%. And the next uh, slide show that uh, Africa continues, Sub-Saharan Africa continue to be the highest burden of Africa in terms of morbidity, representing 82% of the cases, and in terms of mortality, more than 90% of deaths of, of African uh, people. And uh, there is an epidemiological transition. The older children, aged uh, 5 to 15 years, are the most susceptible to the febrile illness, alpha, uh, the youngest remain the most susceptible to the severe disease. Next slide. 11 countries continue to carry the high burden of the disease. In this 11 high burden disease, an increase of 5 million cases of malaria were observed between 2020 and 2021. Alpha, there was a slight decrease of the number of deaths. Four countries uh, had the highest burden. They include RDC, DRC, and Nigeria, Nigeria Niger, Niger, and Tanzania. Next slide. 13 million of pregnant women were exposed to malaria during the, during the last year, and they lived preferably in West and Central Africa. And malaria and pregnancy was responsible for almost 1 million of children born with low birth weight, which impair the quality of their life during the first years. Next. In terms of uh, prevention and case management, there are some progress, but some little progress. Uh, ITN uh, in household coverage is 30%. A little bit higher, but not enough, as well as the IPTP SP3 doses, which coverage is still below 40%. And uh, only 60% of the children with fever sub care in health centers in Africa, in Sub Saharan Africa, the last year. And among them, only 30% benefited for the a prompt di biological diagnosis and the treatment with an ACT. Good news, the average number of children treated with sickle of SMC increased from 0 0.2 million in 2012 to 45 million in 2021. Next slide. There are also some other suites. The spread of the deletion of plasmodium falciparum, HRP2, and trigens which is responsible for of the uh, less sensitivity of RDT tests with a high proportion of fast negative result. Anti-malarial drug and insecticide pyretinoid resistance, which, is, which have been uh, observed in most of the endemic country and which is spreading very fast. And new is the introduction of a new uh, vector in new urban setting, uh, like Anopheles Stefansi, which may put urban population at increased risk of malaria because they do not have 
uh, uh, a good premonition. This next slide, this urban population was also, next slide, this urban population was also the, the, the one which was uh, more exposed to COVID-19 in Africa. The disease itself and the preventive measures such as the lockdown had an indirect effect on malaria in terms of surveillance, prevention, diagnosis and treatment. And this was related to, next slide, to the resource diversion for the COVID response, COVID-19 response, reduce access to healthcare service with its correlate, delay diagnosis, uh, reduce presentation for fever case management, impair availability of drug in some sites and even of preventive uh, tools, reduce malaria prevention campaign. And it was reported that 13 million of cases and 63,000 of deaths were due to the disruption to essential malaria service during the, during the acute phase of the pandemic. Next slide. And this is highlighted in the right figure where we can see that uh, several country uh, noted that there were a reduced frequentation of their clinical service. This reduction was uh, from uh, 4% to 96% reduction on clinical service uh, utilization between 2019 and 2021. Next slide. However, COVID-19 uh, study perform a meta-analysis show that uh, the COVID-19 mortality rate or the number of deaths was quite low compared to the major infectious disease, which still remain important for control and prevention. The COVID-19 death represented 20% of malaria death in 2020. 22% uh, of uh, tuberculosis death and less than 13% of HIV AIDS related death. And the COVID-19 that is lost for these diseases, for the other uh, major infectious disease was less than 5%. When uh, we, uh, next slide. This slide show that Mortality due to malaria did not significantly change during the acute phase of COVID-19. It remained confined to, mainly confined to youngest children between March 2020 and April 2020. And when we see the, the right figure in April 2021, the, there were no increase of the number, significant increase of the number of malaria deaths among the population which was uh, most vulnerable to severe COVID-19 and death, the order of one. Next. Uh, before there was one slide, another slide. Okay, some endemic country first also the, some epidemics of over emerging pathogen, the arbovirus, which were uh, better diagnosed during the pandemic and uh, which were the most uh, diagnosed uh, pathogen in non-malaria febrile illnesses in endemic settings. But which this uh, increase of uh, uh, arboviruses infection in non-malaria febrile illness was associated with, with an over diagnosis of malaria or an over treatment of this patient with non-malaria febrile illness with antibiotic or anti-malarial, even both. And some, the, 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 the histogram in blue and, and red show that the frequentation of some uh, health service increased between 2020 and 2022. And this gave opportunity to screen and to better diagnose malaria, but also to screen for oval febrile illness when people were also screening uh, uh, febrile children for COVID-19. 
Next slide. So what are the solutions? What can we do? I think we have a solution. Uh, we can use the COVID-19 uh, response, which have been put in place in other countries and adapted to the context. We have the solution. We have a drug. We have the preventive tools. And we just need to train people. We just need to have an integrated care package uh, which, uh, can, which will include specific population, uh, several diseases, as it was stated, several other endemic, taking into account co-infection, community, and specific group. And data collection is essential. Data collection will be essential to better characterize the local transmission of malaria. And for a better tailoring of the implementation of a new WHO strategy. This implementation includes the test and treat strategy with new tools, which can be tested and the result will help us for that. New tools and introduce also new chemo prevention strategies such as perennial malaria chemo prevention, uh, post-discharge malaria chemo prevention, mass drug administration, and the hope, the hope, the vaccine, the vaccine, the vaccine. Parasite surveillance, vector control and surveillance, and also uh, endemicity uh, survey and screening will also help. Thank you. Thank you very much. Professor Mariel Boyu for that uh, presentation on the state of malaria in Africa. Thank you. We'll move on now to Dr. John Amwasi, who is the Executive Director of African Research Network for Neglected Tropical Diseases, who is going to, of course, talk to us about the state of NTDs in Africa. Prof, you have the floor. Oh, thank you very much, um, Prof Chair. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here. I'll go straight into my presentation. I would like to um, acknowledge um, the African Research Network for NTDs, which Secretariat I lead from Ghana, as well as um, the WHO Afro NTD uh, unit and Africa DNDI for uh, some of the information that um, I'm about to present. So I'm going to start off with this slide, and I don't know if you can see everything in there, but I like starting with this because it brings home this whole idea of neglect. Uh, this slide is talking about NOMA. And if you should right now, and I took this uh, snip just um, barely a few hours before this uh, uh, session, just so I could have the most up-to-date information. If you take a snip, uh, if you enter the word NOMA into Google, uh, what you're going to find is information about the world's most expensive restaurant. Um, a good meal here will cost you in excess of $500. Uh, it's a good uh, Norwegian restaurant. Uh, I've never been there before. I don't have any immediate plans of going there. Uh, I hold nothing against those who've been there before also. But for me, it just, it just tells you um, what neglect is all about because Noma is also this, all right? So it's a fusiform gangrene or cancrum oris, terrible disease. And I know there's a bunch of people who are asking that this be included in the um, list of NTDs. I guarantee you I had no conversation with anyone. Um, but this is just to point out how, you know, even a disease as terrible as this is hardly known um, in, in our world uh, or in our, in our setup. Um, but NTDs as we know them are what I refer to as a constellation of diseases. No need for me to go into so many details about these, but affecting uh, about a billion people globally. Now, one thing that really is a strong thread running through all these NTDs is the fact that um, most of them are zoonotic in nature. They involve vectors and parasites that also affect animals. And this brings to the fore the role that uh, One Health can play in the fight against NTDs. And very recently, earlier this year, the um, NTD One Health uh, publication was released by the WHO, which I think is a really great um, document uh, important for teaching purposes but also for country level and various level planning purposes because if you understand this this complex um, 
interaction between animals, humans, and the environment we share, uh, and we're able to exploit this understanding, it holds a lot of promise for the control of NTDs. I just want to share a few slides uh, because I can't take all the NTDs one after the other and offer you the state of all of them that would be here for a whole semester. Um, but this is a picture of guinea worm which is now co almost completely absent in, in every country in the world except for a few uh, or one or two in, in our continent. Um, but the worry again is that uh, the dogs uh, might still be the problem because there's still, especially in countries like the Chad and other places, dogs still carry guinea worm and they could uh, end up being a problem in reintroducing this into human populations, again bringing to the fore the, the role that One Health uh, can, can play. Uh, called the disease of the anti-granary because it eventually, uh, or it resulted in a lot of people not being able to work, uh, not being able to pursue a livelihood, therefore not being able to feed their families. Another one which is of great interest to me and I uh, do conduct research in this area is snake bite, uh, which was a, a fairly recent addition to the list of NTDs. It's uh, perhaps um, the only non-infectious, it is actually the only non-infectious NTD, um, but a very important one nonetheless because it's been neglected for so long. Also really interesting because it's one for which the vector or the perpetrator, the snake, it's not one vector you want to eliminate because it plays an important uh, ecological role. So it's just a question of learning how to live with those animals and also being able to provide adequate antivenoms for those who will invariably be bitten by these animals. Another one we've been on or at for a very long time is Oncocercasis. This is a publication all the way from uh, 1988 um, speaking about the problem of this disease, and we're still grappling with this to date. It's been uh, how many years? Almost uh, uh, 30 years plus. And this is what ONCO is able to do. It's able to decimate uh, populations and uh, desertize communities, if I put it that way. Um, people just abandon their communities which otherwise have fertile lands just because the scourge of Onco was just too terrible. This is a picture I obtained from David Molyneux, uh, a picture taken in 1975. And, and the problem still persists to some degree. So the, the real issue, and I apologize, uh, I had some nice graphics, but it looks like um, the differences in ver software versions have distorted things a little bit. Um, but the, the term neglected tropical diseases uh, really is, is speaking to neglected populations and neglected people. It's a bit of a misnomer because we talk about the, the disease being neglected. It's really the people who are being neglected, and these are the, are, are the poorest of the poor. The good thing is that even for HIV, AIDS, and, and TB and malaria, as the previous presenters have spoken about, pretty much the same situation. Um, uh, it's the poorest of the poor who are suffering the most, and this is where we need to keep on emphasizing um, the relevance of NTDs. Now, the reason why I call it a constellation of diseases is that these are diseases that vary uh, quite a lot in terms of the uh, etiology and, and presentation and even their control approaches, but they all have the common denominator of poverty, uh, which speaks to uh, the lens with which um, uh, trying to control uh, these diseases uh, should uh, be applied. Uh, I, because of time, I'll not go through all of these, but it's just uh, showing some of the shared effects uh, that uh, NTDs have on, on populations. And uh, of particular interest these days is the uh, mental health effects of NTDs, which have been largely uh, overlooked. So by way of uh, NTDs in the Africa region, here are some updates. Um, there are currently 20 that are called neglected tropical diseases and 19 of them are found in Africa. So we have almost all of them. Um, five of them are the preventive chemotherapy NTDs, and we have all of them um, uh, here in Africa, and then the 14 others uh, for control and management listed over there. So out of the 20, we have almost all. And these are the current goals that have been set out by the WHO, uh, various disease targets, those that we intend to eradicate, those that we intend to eliminate, uh, those that we intend to eliminate as a public health uh, problem and, and so on. So it's quite a tall list. And of course, now we have the NTD Bible known as the Roadmap. But I really wanted to show this really important slide uh, from the WHO uh, Afro, uh, which speaks to the impact of COVID. And you can see there a 34% decline in NTD treatments in 2020, but a slight bounce back in 2021. Uh, this just tells you how COVID really impacted 
almost all these big uh, disease groups, but also how much clawing back we've been able to do, which, which is a, a very important ray of hope. It's not all doom and gloom. We've made significant progress over the past uh, decade and a half in NTDs. And this is another slide uh, from the WHO that shows some of the progress that uh, has been made um, in NTD control and elimination uh, globally. Um, and these are very, very key, significant uh, decline in, in the burden of these diseases, but yet still uh, problem remains unsolved. Uh, a particular uh, interest perhaps is uh, the African continent where you see uh, that perhaps the greatest progress has been made um, in Africa with regard to um, uh, eliminating uh, at least one NTD and at least 37 African countries have been able to do this over the past decade. Um, Ghana was the first in 2018 to eliminate um, a blinding trachoma in sub-Saharan Africa and was celebrated globally and um, our president uh, also uh, took this very personal and celebrated it. But it just shows that we, we, we have made great progress. We've come a long way right from the uh, London Declaration uh, where there was this intention to eradicate Guinea worm and eliminate five NTDs. Um, we were not completely successful but nonetheless very good progress has been made and Guinea worm is almost out. And today we have the NTD Bible, as we put it, the roadmap, um, which was launched uh, in, in early 2021 and, and really lays out, again, uh, very clearly where we want to go with this. Now, it may seem a lot of blah, blah, a lot of uh, writing and words, but it is really important that we recognize how valuable this document is because it's, it was years of discussion and agreement at very high uh, levels and also at low levels as to what we really want and how we can all be held accountable um, for the, the progress that will be made um, over the years. And it, it's been tiered in such a way that we can measure uh, systematically how well we're doing, but not, not only how well we're doing, but also how quickly we are doing well. And I do encourage you, if you've not had the opportunity, uh, to take a good hard look at this NTD roadmap uh, because it really spells out a lot. I can see that time is against me. I'll, I'll wrap up. I uh, just want to point out major challenges that we have uh, across the continent for NTDs. Uh, the COVID disruptions uh, really uh, were a major dent. I've spoken to these already. Uh, and there is good documentation on this with regard to access to treatment, especially uh, including uh, simple surgeries that could turn people's lives around um, uh, for, for trachoma um, uh, that, that could not be uh, done simply because of COVID. Um, the funding gaps still remain, uh, believe it or not. There has been significant funding pledges, but there are still significant gaps that need to be met if we are indeed to meet the uh, roadmap uh, uh, goals. Um, and also uh, the degree of ownership um, across the continent is a major uh, problem. When I say the degree of ownership, it's the degree to which um, African countries or member states are really owning uh, the fight against NTDs. And this is why um, I keep saying that it is really important that uh, African uh, leadership or involvement in both advocacy and leadership um, remains strong. Um, our leaders have stepped to the plate to some degree, uh, but there's also the need for the researchers and those involved in the, on the ground to also um, uh, be more visible in putting forward uh, their amazing knowledge that they've gathered over the years on the ground regarding how we can be successful in implementing um, the, the roadmap. These are some of the barriers that we're currently facing in, across the continent with regard to NTD uh, research. Uh, right from funding through to institutional issues and the individual issues and then uh, the non-financial issues, including language barrier, geographic location, uh, and disciplinary issues, the social sciences versus the biological sciences and so on. But recognizing that uh, really these are very complex diseases that require um, a, a multidisciplinary approach. And now we're even recognizing more and more uh, the need for the One Health approach towards One Health, so, uh, towards uh, addressing um, NTDs. So uh, if, if we're to be successful, these barriers will have to be systematically um, uh, analyzed and 
and appropriate measures put in place. Thankfully, um, as I mentioned, the leaders have been very bold in, in declaring uh, what their intentions are uh, via the Kigali Summit, and the, the hope and expectation is that these will be actioned. Uh, these will be actioned. Uh, the plan is via these five main strategic interventions. I'll not read all of them, uh, but uh, what I like about this is that they have clearly marked out those that are targeting humans, and this is a reflection of the recognition that the success of uh, the control and elimination of NTDs is not only limited uh, to human populations. We're recognizing uh, the socio-ecological framework within which this is to be done, including um, animals in the shared uh, environment. And with that, uh, I will conclude uh, with my last slide on, on the way forward. Um, and this has already been made mention of uh, by the WHO, but uh, I think, again, emphasizing the cardinal role that the roadmap has to play uh, so that we all coalesce around it, but also recognizing that there are lessons to be learned where we have been less than successful, uh, where we've uh, kept on trying things that have not yet yielded the results that we need, uh, therefore requiring, requiring different strategies, um, where there's the need for more implementation research and socio-anthropological research to inform how we deploy uh, technologies and interventions that we know work, but just how to release these and uh, or implement these and monitor these are sometimes a challenge. Uh, and then finally, uh, the need for collaboration, integration, strong partnerships across the board. Uh, and particularly, again, I reemphasize uh, the need for a One Health lens to be applied uh, to this. And with that, I'd like to say thank you for having me. I look forward to the questions. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. John Amwesi the state of entities in Africa. We move to the last one now, Professor Mofat Nyerenda from MRC Uganda, who will be talking to us about the threat of NCDs and climate change to the control of infectious diseases in Africa. You have the floor, sir. Well, thanks very much indeed, and uh, thank you for uh, prioritizing NCDs, even if it's um, essentially the last talk of the, of the day, but hopefully uh, still as uh, useful. Hopefully next time I'll come, I'll come after a, a NTDs. But uh, what I want to talk about is um, essentially describe in a very brief fashion the uh, interactions or collisions between different epidemics or pandemics, uh, non-communicable diseases, infection, and now there will be the effects of climate change. And, uh, and because this will become very uh, important in Africa and it also shaping how NCDs and perhaps under other conditions manifest themselves in, on the continent. So this is just a cartoon that depicts what um, uh, epidemiologists call the transition and, and essentially showing that uh, as we've heard earlier on, we have made some gains in terms of uh, uh, the control of infectious diseases. By no means a finished business, but at least there have been some gains. But at the same time, there is an increase in the prevalence of non-communicable diseases. Uh, obviously, other continents, other regions have had NCD spikes. You know, the Americans had it. The uh, Chinese have had the sort of uh, rise more recently. But when people who know about these things uh, uh, look at what's happening in Africa, it looks like the speed of this epidemic is particularly high. And we don't know why that is the case, but that seems to be what uh, most people observe. And I, I'm a diabetologist, I'm a, di a diabetes expert, so I'll give examples relating to diabetes. And, and if you look at the projections in terms of uh, how a diabetes is going to evolve over the next uh, 20 years or so. And, and if you look at all the regions in, in uh, that box there, it's Africa that is going to see the highest increase in the number of cases. So, you know, uh, this has now been revised, but the current estimates are, that, are, are such that um, we will probably see a 150% increase in the prevalence of diabetes in Africa. So a major impact. So when people look at these things, NCDs in particular, diabetes specifically, what we tend to uh, think about is clearly overweight, that this is 
a manifestation of globalization and that uh, people are getting fatter because we're eating more and junky food and we're sedentary, not exercising. That's what the uh, dogma is. That's what the uh, tradition tells us. That's what I would say the Western stereotype uh, would, would dictate. But, but what I want to tell you today is that if we only focus on this, we'll probably be making a mistake and it's potentially going to be very dangerous. Because when you go to a diabetic clinic, what you see is this. And if you, I don't know whether it's projecting clearly, but if you look at it, there are very few uh, old people in there. There are very few people who are overweight or indeed obese. So the phenotype, the characteristic of individuals with diabetes in Africa doesn't necessarily fit the traditional, uh, the Western stereotype. So that's the emphasis that I want to make, that clearly we need to try and focus on obesity. It does play a part, but there are other very, very important uh, contextual factors that uh, uh, contribute to the burden of NCDs within the context of uh, the African continent. And, and uh, so I'm just trying to emphasize this point again by looking at data, for example, from the uh, United States, where they've done epidemiological studies, again, looking at how many people have diabetes compared to, uh, in relation to how heavy they are in terms of their BMI. So essentially, it's people who are overweight, it's people who are obese that you tend to see diabetes in. But if you look at a study that was just done in Uganda, again, looking at individuals with diabetes or its precursor, what we call a, a pre-diabetes, and you say how many of those individuals have got obesity or overweight, you'll find that the majority of individuals in this rural area who've got diabetes actually have a normal BMI. If anything, some of them has a low BMI. So if you just focused on obesity as a major contributor for diabetes, then you miss out a number of these, a bigger proportion of individuals who should be targeted for screening as well as management. And, and, and so, so what's going on? What's making Africans particularly predisposed to diabetes at a levels of a BMI that are fairly low? It may well be the genetics. This continent has the biggest heterogeneity in terms of diversity in genetics, so we may be susceptible. It may be the environment, and I think that's where the key uh, gains will be if we look carefully. Is it the infection? Is it um, the influence of nutrition? Those are the issues that we want to be looking at. And, and I just want to talk about um, uh, nutrition a little bit. The chap that you see there is um, called David Barker. He was a professor of uh, epidemiology in Southampton, made some very startling uh, observations about uh, uh, three decades ago now, when he looked at individuals who were born in a tiny uh, uh, region in the UK, Hertfordshire. And these were people in their 50s, 60s, and they happened to have some very good birth records. So he just looked at their birth weight and say, now, in your 60s, 70s, have you got diabetes? Have you got hypertension? Have you got some of these chronic conditions? And essentially found that the lower you are at birth, the lower your, your, your um, a, a birth weight is, the higher the risk of diabetes, the higher the risk of hypertension. So the UK is not struggling with malnutrition or low birth, at, birth weight at the moment. It's Africa where you have the highest a, a prevalence of birth, low birth weight. And, and, and if that is linked to long-term risk of NCDs, you can just imagine how a match it will be for this continent to contain with um, NCDs because of this inherent susceptibility due to undernutrition, particularly during pregnancy or early in childhood. Uh, infection is obviously another key uh, element. All today we've heard about how HIV 
is um, a, a associated with increased risk of non-communicable diseases, whether it's because of the infection itself, because of inflammation, or because of the drugs that we use to treat these infections. And, and the TB and diabetes, there is a huge association there. But more recently, we've also heard about COVID and its um, ability to contribute to NCDs. Initially, in the sense that people who have got these comorbidities are more likely to die from COVID, but in actual sense, the converse is just as, as, as true. So if you've COVID, you are more likely to have diabetes. Again, either because of the inflammation, but more importantly, the virus can actually attack your pancreas, makes your pancreas small, and therefore you also develop diabetes in that fashion. The bit that I have on my uh, right are data from Germany, of all places, looking at people that have had um, herpes viruses, very common viruses, and then they follow them up and see whether and how a, a, their risk of developing diabetes is, is, evolves. And essentially to say that if you've got these viruses, you have a much higher risk of a, having diabetes and other NCDs. So if we harbor all these viruses here, you can just about imagine how these viruses will contribute to risk of these conditions, and yet we tend to focus on things that are mostly uh, due to factors like obesity. So this has a huge amount of complica uh, implications because if we screen for diabetes, if we want to manage diabetes, the main focus is lose weight, eat less, do a lot of exercise. That's okay if your diabetes is caused by a, a, a obesity. And even drugs, most of the drugs, metformin, the drug that we use for treating obesity, it basically tries to dissolve your fat. But if you are in a situation like in that clinic where you are not necessarily obese, these, are these approaches going to work? Are we using the right approaches? So there is need to understand contextual factors develop strategies that will actually help with um, the uh, challenge that we have. And, and uh, just, I just want to talk a little bit about the uh, uh, disparities in uh, care uh, services. So if you look at um, uh, HIV here, we've already talked about how the challenge is still there, but we've made a huge uh, uh, difference in terms of the gains. So a lot of a, a, a move gains towards the 1990-90, and, and, and thanks to the support of partners, the services are very well resourced, and, and, and therefore, and, and we can learn a huge amount from HIV. But as I said, I keep putting on this picture, you can see the poverty, you can see the lack of resources. What can we do to try and uh, make things a little better, more equal. So with diabetes, less than 5% or 10% of individuals accessing care, no medications, whereas with HIV, you have good supply of um, ARVs. How can we address these discrepancies, these huge uh, disparities in care? And, and so one of the things that we've tried to do recently, and, and uh, Professor Agnes alluded to this, is to try and integrate care. Why can't we bring about a situation whereby, regardless of your HIV status, whether you're diabetic or hypertension, we know that these are chronic conditions, they need chronic care, they share risk factors, you know, why can't we bring them together? So that's what we did in Uganda and Tanzania, basically dismantle the silos, bring people together in, in one clinic, a same clinicians, same dispensing, same record, same everything. Obviously, we're worried that with this approach, we have to be careful. We don't want to disrupt what we've already gained in terms of HIV. How can we do it in a managed fashion? The worry was also that a lot of stigma and therefore people walk with their feet and not attend the clinics. And, 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 and so we wanted to see what will happen to HIV control, what will happen to these NCDs, and at what cost. And, and these are just some of the results that we have. Essentially, people did not walk with their feet. Very good retention in terms of um, both in people with HIV 
as well as in individuals with um, uh, NCDs. Over 90% retention. Good uh, uh, control of uh, uh, HIV, so HIV services were not compromised. Very good uh, viral. Are you saying I should stop? Sorry. <laughs> and a and modest improvement in, um, in a control of non-communicable diseases. But more importantly for policymakers, if you just looked at people with multiple conditions, you had huge savings. So if you wanted to manage one person you know, per visit with um, uh, these multiple conditions, you'd get $3. But if you use this integrated clinic, you saved a huge amount because um, a, a, instead of um, a, a, a 20 something dollars, 15 dollars, you only paid three dollars. So huge savings. So, so I just want to emphasize that within the context of Africa, when we look at these conditions, these NCDs are conditions of old age, uh, degenerative diseases. Uh, we are mostly, uh, been, we've been focusing on these traditional risk factors, smoking, sedentariness, alcohol, but what I'm trying to advocate is that there are proximal factors. There are factors that come when earlier on in life, whether related to diet, whether related to malnutrition or things like that, which can program you, which can make you a, a, at risk of these conditions right earlier on in life. And, and then there are these issues of um, infection, which I've talked about, so we need to consider those within the context of Africa and that um, with climate change, obviously there will be food insecurity and therefore nutritional issues are going to be crucial. We need to think about them. There will be issues of uh, emerging and emerging uh, pandemics, infections, which may exacerbate the, the uh, uh, issues around NCDs. And more importantly, there will be disruptions in systems. So we should be imaginative in terms of integrated care but at the same time, the roads may be eroded, and therefore we need to be imaginative on how we will sustain these uh, services. And in Rwanda, we heard about how drones were utilized during the uh, pandemic. So if, if we have floods, can we still use that to make sure that these individuals who need lifelong care, chronic care, can receive their services? I'll stop there, and um, uh, thank you very much for your attention. Very much, Prof. Mofatinyarinda, for that. I was really hoping that would have at least. Let me try 30 seconds for each one. If the panel members can say something, and really sorry, I wanted to have a discussion, but we can't. Let's just ask for Africa CDC. I just want to know for infectious disease control, Prof. Mohamed, what are your priorities for 2023? 30 seconds. Thank you. Um, for, for 2023, we, we want to support our member states uh, with their priorities. And uh, generally, we know that um, uh, this will include um, uh, identifying the areas of gap for workforce and helping to plug that gap because we need the workforce to be able to take care of the problem, then also to try to begin to look at how we can uh, uh, help with um, um, the availability of medication, essential medication at the level of the PHC. And uh, of course, working to get the community health workers to be the frontline people in the response. Thank you. What is the, does the future look like for HIV in Africa? Really brief. It should not be neglected because we are focusing on others. Just add care. Don't remove care for adding something else. <clears throat> Never forget that <clears throat> because 3% uh, now, like in this country, it's stable because we keep the people alive. But if we don't uh, focus on continuous prevention and treatment of the sick, we are going to lose the battle anyway. Thank you. Same question for Prof. Nurenda. What does the future look like for TB control? Tom? <coughs> TB control. Yes, what does the future look like? 
I think, I think the future yeah, looks bright, briefly. Um, the TB world is getting wiser after what we have gone through. And uh, as I said, the main issue in TB is really to look at that incidence and look for the cases, because it's those cases that are not out there that are untreated that uh, make, can make the, uh, the disease epidemic worse. So if we can do a good job to find them, treat them, and contain them until they're cured, then we'll be on the right track. Okay. Professor Marielle Buyo, I hope you're still there. Just want to thank you for taking your time joining us from so far away. You talked about the new tools for mal malaria. Which one new tool you think would really make a change for malaria? It's not there. No preventive strategies, but also um, uh, the fact that an integrated approach and the, 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 the need to take into account uh, the community what's happening in the community, specific population. And uh, of course, uh, new drug development because we have city and we have a threat of uh, artemisinin resistance. So there is a need to improve research on new drugs. And why not, why do not think about uh, traditional or herbal plan for malaria treatment? Thank you. Thank you. And uh, Dr. John Amwasi, how close are we to eradicating guinea worm? Now I hear they're in dogs and so on. How close are we? I think it's a great question. Um, we, we, are, we are really close, uh, almost there. But the reason why there is cautious optimism is because of this canine guinea worm. So perhaps more emphasis or focus on the risk that canine guinea worm poses and the quicker we're able to begin to strategize around this, uh, the better for all of us. Because the last thing we want is to declare uh, an elimination um, in, in humans only for it to bounce back um, years later simply because we ignored uh, applying that uh, mm -hmm. socio-ecological context to it and understanding that it really it's a One Health approach that is needed uh, to finally get rid of this ancient disease. I was on a yesterday talk about Tunga penetrance. I look for it on your list. It wasn't there. There's so much of it in Africa, Tunga. Mm -hmm. Anyway, uh, Prof. Uh, Mofat Nirenda, how should Africa prepare for this conversion? You have the collision of NCDs, infectious diseases, and climate change. Just very brief. I, mean, I, think, I think it's fair to say that things will get worse before they get better. Uh, the, the major issue with NCDs is that they are insidious. So there are a lot of people out there who have these conditions who do not know that they've, this, they've got these conditions. So if we then uh, get these people to know about these conditions, will the healthcare systems, are they going to cope? We need to have imaginative ways of, of um, uh, delivering care Otherwise, the whole system will be overwhelmed. But there is a huge amount of potential to approach things in a much more holistic manner. And, and that's how we are going to make gains and be much more efficient. Can I take one burning question? Yes, this one right there. Just to, I want to feel we interacted a little bit with the microphone, please, very fast. We just now passed. Ron, thank you. Okay, thank you, presenters, uh, very much. I am Dr. Barakat from Ethiopia, Hawassa University. Uh, my question is, um, I'm very much concerned of drug resistance for malaria, for tuberculosis, and HIV. I have, as a clinician, I encountered patients with resistance, with malaria, a treated patient with PO medication come with multi-organ failure because of drug resistance. I encountered patient with drug resistance TB and even drug resistance for second line HIV. So African CDC, especially concerning this drug resistance, as a drug resistance, it should be headache for 
the whole the WHO for African citizens too. So what special thing is considered regarding this drug resistance? Yeah, thank you very much. So I think that's a very important question. And we had a session next door where AMR was uh, also subject of the day. And there are a lot of issues around that. Uh, human behavior and also uh, substandard uh, products that are in circulation in sub-Saharan Africa, uh, et cetera, et cetera, including natural trends of how uh, bugs get uh, resistant to environmental um, uh, pressure. So I think the answer is not very straightforward uh, to you. I think what we need to do is in integrated care, we need to have a system where now we are collecting good epidemiological data on uh, what, whatever resistance there is, so that we can have better, better uh, interventions. We know where the sources and we know where the factors in, involved in are. You've mentioned about TB. And most of the TB, uh, like in South Africa, the MDR, XDR, TB, if you look at what behaviors that they've been having, some of them are say, well, I haven't even missed a single dose of TB before, TB drugs before, yeah, I don't know how it got to me. So there's a lot of things that we don't know. So what I'm saying is I think we need to go backwards and do good work so that we have information that can make us craft policies around what we do. I don't know whether that answers your question. Yeah, Prof wants to add something there. Yeah. Yes, I want to say that our solution in Africa is in promoting research in institute of research and in universities. Because the majority of things we have and we are using here has been set elsewhere, but have been set by the majority by the factories that are selling us drugs. Could we now a work on researchers, on research that matter for us, for the future of Africa. So that's the solution. If not, we will still be the beggars of the science. Okay. Thank you, Prof. Agnes. I just want to, you know, say, Tom, I'm going to hand over to you because you are closing. I just want to thank the audience. And really thank you all panelists. I think this has been a really well presented and well you know, interaction that has taken place between the panelists and then at least with the audience. And I'm so glad to see you all stayed here. And you know we have a lot to do in Africa for these infectious diseases, for the NCDs, climate change and all. You know, but we come to Rwanda and I think we have a lot to learn from Rwanda to take back home with us on how we can better move forward in each of our countries in this area. Thank you. I'll hand over to Tom to close. Thank you, Thank you Prof. And I can have a much better closing than what you, shall, you have just done. So as your co-moderator, I say, I endorse what you have said and the meeting is adjourned. Thank you very much for your... <laughs> <laughs> and we thank all the uh, organizers and, as I said, Professor Agnes, many, many thanks to you. Some of the, us will be leaving tomorrow, we won't see you again, but I think the future of Africa is really bright if we have leaders like you at the forefront. We have experts like you guys. <laughs> <laughs>
dead. What is this session called? Huh? What is the side event? Hold on, hold on. I need to. No, give me, give me, give me. No, give me your phone. Ladies and gentlemen, we have a side event taking place in the room. We kindly ask you to vacate the stage area. And you're also welcome to join the event. It's called Africa Leading the Way in Global, Pacif in global Public Health. Africa leading the way in global public health will be taking place in this room in the next few minutes. We kindly ask you to vacate the stage.